thank you very much for everyone for coming. In particular, uh, thank you to Vice President Stavros Lambrinidis of the European Parliament. And thank you to our President, Joseph Borrell, for being here too. And in particular, thank you to Professor Harold Coe for accepting to, giving, to give this lecture. Um, I will make a very brief presentation of Professor Harold Coe because I don't think much is needed. He's very well known. He's one of the most important scholars in international law and human rights. He has been dean of Yale Law School for several years. He's the recipient of many awards and honorary doctoral degrees, <laughs> but he also has a politics or policy career. Um, originally, if I'm not mistaken, in the Reagan administration in the Department of Justice, then <laughs> as an assistant uh, Secretary of State uh, for Human Rights and Democracy during the Clinton administration, and now currently uh, he has been appointed by President Obama as the legal advisor of the State Department. So thank you very much, Harold, for coming, and the floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Miguel, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, when I was dean of the law school at Yale, someone told me that being the dean is like being the keeper of the cemetery, in that on the organizational chart, there are many people below you, but there's no sign that any of them are paying any attention. <laughs> so this is, a, for me, a, quite a, an honor to have uh, the undivided attention of so many distinguished uh, figures. I want to especially pay tribute to my friend, the brilliant uh, Miguel Maduro, who is very lucky, you are very lucky to have him here, Martin Scheinen, who's made such a contribution in the area of human rights and terrorism, and then my student, uh, Stavros Lombardidis, who, uh, while he looks pretty much the same as he did when he was in my class, has uh, risen to a position of great distinction within the European Parliament. And thank you, Mr. President, uh, for this invitation. Uh, what I wanted to do was to uh, give you a sense, uh, for 30 years I have been working in this field, and as Miguel suggests, I have uh, three perspectives on the subject uh, as an academic uh, scholar, a teacher, and dean, as a human rights lawyer uh, and policymaker, and then as a government official. I worked in the Justice Department of the Reagan administration in the 80s. Uh, the, uh, I was Assistant Secretary for Human Rights in the Clinton administration in the 90s and now legal advisor for the Obama administration in the 21st century. Uh, the job which I have, legal advisor of the State Department, uh, I had a law firm, public international law firm of about 180 lawyers called L, uh, and we play four roles. We are the counselor of the State Department in general counsel, uh, so we do what other lawyers for the government do. We buy buildings, they happen to be in Kabul. Uh, we negotiate contracts, they happen to be in Baghdad. Uh, we uh, work on issues of diplomatic immunity, consular immunity. Uh, but the second function, I think, is a broader one, which is to be the conscience of the US government with regard to international law. This requires also that we defend US interests in various settings. And so I've appeared on behalf of the US at the International Court of Justice in the Kosovo case, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement arbitration panel in the Grand River case. Uh, we are debating the question of uh, what role to play, if any, in the European Court of Justice with regard to sanctions. Uh, I regularly sign or uh, engage on briefs before the US courts on issues of uh, international and foreign relations law. Uh, we appear before the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal, and we co coordinate activities before all of the tribunals, including the International Criminal Court, the Yugoslav Tribunal, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, etc. cetera. Uh, and then fourth and finally, um, a role of the legal advisor is to be a spokesperson for the U.S. on our relationship uh, to international law. It's an unusually academic position uh, there are 22 legal advisors. This year happens to be our 80th birthday. We were founded by Congress in 1931 on February 23rd. In fact, we have existed since uh, 1848. Uh, <clears throat> but the relationship between the legal advisors office and the international legal community 
gives what I think is an important duty of uh, explanation with regard to past and proposed uh, actions. So these roles and three perspectives, I think, have given me the opportunity to consider two questions. The first, uh, obviously, is uh, has the Obama administration's approach to international law been changed we can believe in? I noticed the global governance uh, program says ideas change. <laughs> uh, and if you read the blogosphere, you would conclude uh, that both the right and left of the political spectrum see no difference between the Obama's administration's approach to international law and the Bush administration's. Uh, the right argues uh, there's no change, but continuity we can believe in. Uh, the left argues uh, they see no change, and they, because they see no change, they don't believe. Uh, I think that when the entire blogosphere agrees, for diametrically opposite reasons is probably wrong. And uh, that's my central uh, thesis today. Now there's a second question, which many here in Europe are often asking, which is, is there a peculiarly American form of international law? Uh, is there an international law approach that Americans can believe in, that non-Americans can understand, uh, that's distinctively American insofar as it's within the margin of appreciation? Uh, but that's consistent with American values like the Constitution, democracy, and limited government, as well as emerging global understandings. And um, I am on my way to uh, Strasbourg tomorrow morning and then to Geneva, where I will be concluding our presentation before the UN Human Rights Council. Um, at the UN Human Rights Council, as you may know, every, uh, the United States had not been a member under this administration, it re-engaged, more on that in a moment. Uh, and then we do a universal periodic review in which we receive uh, recommendations from other members' countries. Uh, many countries receive one or two recommendations. Uh, we received uh, 228, uh, which is twice as many as the nearest um, uh, competitor, namely Sweden. Uh, now, <laughs> it's interesting because when you look at the uh, recommendations we receive, uh, they show that there are at least seven areas in which those who ask us questions have a, a different perspective on international law than do Americans. And I think it's worth uh, highlighting those because they're often not obvious to those on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, the first is the approach to treaties. Uh, many European uh, countries or other countries take a perspective of what I would call uh, ratification before compliance. Uh, let's face it, many countries have ratified these human rights treaties, are not even close to being in compliance, and their criticism of the United States is that we have not ratified these treaties, uh, when in fact our compliance record may well be better. So one obvious question is compliance versus ratification versus ratification before compliance. This is a philosophical difference. Uh, a second is the approach to the death penalty. I am personally opposed to the death penalty. I've said this, I've litigated against the death penalty. Uh, nevertheless, I do not believe that the death penalty, uh, fairly administered, violates international law. I believe that there are, uh, there's a, a standard emerging, particularly here in Europe, which opposes the death penalty and would like it to violate international law. But at this moment, I think fundamentally there's a difference of policy on this position. The United States has in recent years struck down uh, various manifestations of the death penalty, uh, the execution of minors, the execution of persons with mental retardation. I think at the core, which is does the practice of uh, the death penalty, which uh, by the way is mentioned in the ICCPR specifically as a form of uh, uh, judicial as opposed to uh, extrajudicial execution still is consistent with international law rules. There's a different standard emerging, but I think the difference is a policy difference and not a legal difference. Or take a third, <coughs> uh, an approach to economic, social, and cultural rights. This is obviously a famous uh, difference, as you see, for example, in our debates over health care. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1941 mentioned freedom from want uh, as a kind of right, uh, but in fact the United States has signed but not ratified the uh, International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. 
There's a difference in approach to domestic implementation. Many uh, non-American approaches focus on uh, national and regional human rights institutions. Uh, the U.S. approach tends to focus on the existing institutions of the federal government, judicial, legislative, and executive. With regard to foreign law, there is a debate over the extent to which foreign law ought to be applied uh, as a matter of domestic jurisprudence. When I say a difference between the United States and Europe, it also includes, obviously, uh, Canada, Israel, and other countries. Uh, <clears throat> there's a difference in approach to freedom of expression and religion. The United States tends to be more tolerant with respect to issues like uh, hate speech, and then finally, seventh, there is a difference in approach to national security, uh, as expressed most recently in what I think was uh, a wave of uh, protests against uh, the Bush administration policies regarding treatment, international humanitarian law, Guantanamo privacy, and what was called the global war on terror. I, I mentioned these seven differences to show that we can all believe in a concept of international law and have disagreements about the particular conceptions of international law. And uh, that doesn't necessarily make either side's approach illegitimate. Now, <clears throat> I've written about what I call five faces of American exceptionalism uh, in an article in 2003 in the Stanford Law Review. And I tried to distinguish between five kinds of exceptionalism. Uh, Many criticize American exceptionalism. I think of it like uh, cholesterol. There's good and bad cholesterol. <laughs> In the same way, there's good and bad uh, exceptionalism. Uh, because uh, the United States is at its worst when it's promoting double standards. Uh, it's at its best when I think it's engaging in exceptional human rights leadership. And for those who say America is the problem, America is the problem. It forgets the times in which America is the solution. And frankly, without America, there is no solution. Uh, and I, I think we have to be uh, aware of this, uh, uh, the importance uh, of uh, American participation in the international human rights and rule of law system for that system to work. Now, <clears throat> in our Supreme Court, there is a famous debate going on now about nationalism versus transnationalism. Uh, that's more of a parochial debate, but of great interest. Second, we have a distinctive rights culture, particularly with regard to freedom of expression. Sometimes we use different labels for the same terms. Uh, for example, uh, our statistics on police activity do not include the word torture. They use the word police brutality. Now, this is a label difference. It's not a conceptual difference. Uh, so it's not an example of exceptionalism, it's an example of uh, a, 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 the lack of a uh, integrated terminology. Uh, Lewis Henkin, the great late professor of Columbia Law School, referred to what he called the flying buttress mentality, the notion that in the cathedral of human rights, the United States is often a flying buttress outside the structure supporting it, but refusing to enter in. And this is another face of exceptionalism. But I think that, uh, for me, the most important difference, and the one worth exploring, is double standards. To what extent is the US actually urging a different standard for itself than for others? That I would call bad exceptionalism. Uh, I don't think that's uh, consistent with the universal rule of human rights or international law. On the other hand, uh, exceptional leadership does not necessarily require double standards. So <clears throat> with regard to this question, is there an American international law, uh, I would ask, uh, is this approach that's emerging uh, on the bad side of the line or on the acceptable side of the line, is it consistent with global understandings and the margin of appreciation? Uh, is there an approach that Americans can find consistent with American values of constitution, democracy, and limited government? Now. <laughs> These two questions, have we seen change we can believe in, and is there a distinctively American international law, I think is relevant to three debates, academic, judicial, and policy. On the academic side, uh, in uh, both the American left and the American right, uh, there are those who say that American international law approaches is inconsistent with emerging European understandings. Uh, my colleague Jed Rubenfeld at Yale is an example of someone who takes this position from the left. Uh, Jack Goldsmith uh, of Harvard and those called the New 
sovereigntists take this position from the right. Customary international law they claim is somehow inconsistent with core American values. I think this is an odd position given that the United States was founded and the Constitution created in 1789 around the notion of decent respect for the opinions of mankind and based on the notion that courts would find customary law. So it's a very late in the day to discover that what we have been doing since the beginning of the US Republic is inconsistent with core American values. But anyway, that's an academic debate. <laughs> There's a judicial debate. I've mentioned the debate between the right and left wings of the US Supreme Court on the question of application of foreign law. Uh, Right now, the swing vote is Justice Anthony Kennedy. This has happened to crop up, particularly in the context of the death penalty, the war on terror, uh, and in uh, same-sex sodomy cases, Lawrence versus Texas, which happens to be the first case in which the US Supreme Court cited to uh, a precedent of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, it's also going on in the lower courts a case not widely seen, but which is a very important one, El Bahami, Bahani versus Obama. The question was whether international law informs US authority to detain uh, in armed conflict under the authorization of use of military force resolution. Uh, the panel, composed of two conservative judges, among others, said that uh, international law did not apply but when it went to the full court, they rejected this analysis. So there's an ongoing battle going on within the same lower court, and it, my guess it will eventually make its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, finally, it seems to me that in the policy debate over national security, uh, you can never uh, eliminate all differences of view, but there should be a reasonable discourse about where we differ. Uh, and I would argue, uh, as I've suggested, that uh, both the extreme left and right are wrong on this issue. Uh, I align myself with uh, someone called John Stewart, uh, who, the leader of the M Million Moderate March, uh, who believes there is a change in our approach, uh, I believe, there's a change, I don't know, if, I don't attribute this to John Stewart. There is change to our approach to international law that we need to keep working for it and to sustain an American international law with legitimacy at home and acceptability abroad, we need a calmer, civil discussion to reduce polarization, two kinds. Uh, polarization between two US and foreign attitudes toward international law and between the American left and the American right. So another title for this remark could be just simply reducing polarization and how can that be achieved. So let me ask you three questions and then try to answer them. Um, just to give you a flavor, the answer to all three questions I will tell you is yes. <laughs> so does the Obama administration have, I think, a co coherent and sustainable legal and policy approach uh, to our policies? Yes. I think, uh, have we brought change to the US approach to international law? I think yes. And does that explain our actions with respect to 9-11, international law, international institutions, international engagement, especially trees? Uh, and I would argue yes. So let me make this case, and then I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, let me get, begin with uh, the president's uh, approach both during the campaign and in his first two years of office. Uh, a new year of engagement has begun in this era, living our values, he said, doesn't make us weaker, it makes us safer, and it makes us stronger. Uh, this is a consistent theme of this president in a series of speeches he's given at the National Archives, his Nobel lecture, his Cairo speech, uh, his speech in uh, uh, Warsaw with regard to nuclear weapons. Uh, Secretary Clinton, my boss, has said much the same. Uh, we need to apply smart power, a full range of tools, including the legal tool. Respect for tool law is an essential element of our smart power, and intense creative diplomacy must be uh, accompanied by intense lawyering. <coughs> which I think leads to an emerging Obama-Clinton doctrine, uh, which has four elements. Principled engagement, diplomacy as a critical element of smart power, strategic multilateralism, and living our values, following rules of law, domestic and international, and following universal, not double standards. 
Now, those who believe that, in fact, this has not been the guiding principle, I say we're two years into an administration that we hope runs for eight years. Uh, it's, I think, unfair to compare an administration that has served for eight years with one that served for, for two years, but the guidelines of our positions are now emerging, and let me go through them. In particular settings, first, uh, Guantanamo. Is the United States still committed to closing Guantanamo? Second, with respect to the armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, are there changes between this administration and the Bush administration regarding the question of whether to detain, detainability, how to detain, humane treatment, who to use force against targeting, the use of legal engagement with regard to the International Criminal Court and the Human Rights Council. And I would say that our overriding commitment has been simple. Uh, we are committed to complying with all applicable law, including the laws of war and all aspects of these ongoing armed conflicts, full stop. Uh, with regard to Afghanistan, Iraq against Al-Qaeda, detention operations and targeting consistent with both the applicable laws of war and the Constitution laws of the United States. Uh, when this ends, I will resign. But for now, this is uh, uh, something which this administration, I think, has done a good job uh, keeping a focus upon. And <laughs> President Obama has made this point in two major speeches, one before the National Archives in May 2009, where he says, we are at war with Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. We need to update our institutions with abiding confidence in the rule of law and due process. When he received the Nobel Prize, he said, where force is necessary, we have a moral and strategic interest in certain rules, and the U.S. must remain a standard bearer in the conduct of that war. So the archives framework has four pieces, not one, four pieces. And when I travel around the world, the thing that shocks me is how few people understand these four basic pieces. These were set forth in May 2009. These have not changed. They were set forth in May 2009. They are four pieces. It is a package, I repeat. These are four pieces. And the next time you read a story about one of them, ask what's going on with the other three. Uh, number one, where possible and feasible, we try those who have violated criminal law in federal court. Uh, in some cases, uh, we may need to use revised military commissions, and the laws have been amended. Third, from Guantanamo, we will transfer those who can be safely transferred. And fourth, where there are no other options, we will continue detention under the laws of war and consistent with the principles of the laws of war. Now, uh, last Monday, the administration reaffirmed this framework. To, I should say, much uh, criticism and uh, little understanding, uh, all the administration said was, one, we remain committed to civilian trials, two, we will resume military commissions on Guantanamo for now until it's closed, three, we will continue transfers consistent with the law, fourth, with regard to prolonged detention, we will have an executive order on periodic review, and we will strengthen humanitarian treatment guarantees by supporting the advice and consent to additional protocol two of the Geneva Conventions and henceforth comply with Article 75, Additional Protocol One on humane treatment, which is the successor provision to common Article Three, out of a sense of legal obligation. So this is simply reaffirming the basic elements of the archive speech. Now, <clears throat> Guantanamo remains open. This is a disappointment. Uh, my point is a very simple one. Uh, you could close Guantanamo tomorrow by abandoning these principles. Uh, the important thing to me is that the principles be applied in the way that Guantanamo is closed. Uh, as of today, uh, the numbers are down from 242 at the beginning of the administration. 172 remain. 59 are approved for transfers. Some 57 Yemenis are there, which is a peculiar situation, as you know, and now made even more complicated by the unrest in Yemen. Uh, 36 have been referred for prosecution either to Article III courts or military commissions. 47 have been designated for continued law of war detention. 67 have been transferred. One has been tried and sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, <laughs> the president said we remain committed to closing Guantanamo. It's not for lack of trying. Uh, the politics are different. Those who ask why haven't we closed Guantanamo yet, 
Uh, it's pretty simple. The president can't close Guantanamo by himself. Uh, we need help from our allies. Uh, they have been very stalwart, uh, but most allies have taken one or two. Congress has been uh, very restrictive in imposing legislative restrictions and is prepared to impose more. All of these cases are before the courts. But closing Guantanamo remains a commitment of the administration. We believe that it is a, um, a negative symbol. It remains a tool for recruitment. And we think that terrorism prosecutions in Article Three courts have succeeded. The Richard Reed case, the Almari case, Padilla, the Zazi case, Shahzad, Gailani are all examples that our civilian courts work. Now, <clears throat> we are facing a series of legislative restrictions uh, the latest have been enacted in the last, or have been introduced in the last week by Senators Graham and McKeon. Uh, in my adult lifetime, this is the most difficult political environment uh, that I've seen in Washington, and it imposes a series of possible restrictions, which I think will again make the politics even more complicated. So the speed of closure may not be what we want. The important thing is sticking by the framework. What about detention operations? Uh, here, we have interpreted the scope of detention authority as authorized by the U.S. Congress and as informed by the laws of war. Uh, we are not relying on the president's inherent authority as commander-in-chief, which was the pattern under the last administration. Humane treatment is the most obvious difference. When people say they see no difference between the Obama administration and the Bush administration, I would ask you, where is there proof of inhumane treatment by this administration? And the answer is there are no examples because it has been eliminated. And that in fact, <coughs> all interrogations must now be conducted consistent with common article three. Uh, the US has made it even clear in the last week that it will seek advice and consent to the additional protocol two and will comply with additional protocol one, article 75 as opinio juris. <laughs> now, it turns out that as a matter of international law, we believe that certain basic principles remain. Uh, we are fighting a war of self-defense with Afghanistan. We have a consenting partner. Uh, the UN Security Council has authorized all necessary measures to fulfill the mandate. Uh, we comply with the laws of war, but detention of enemy belligerents is a permitted feature of armed conflict. And our general approach is to look to functional membership in an armed group, which is consistent with the position taken by the International Committee of the Red Cross in its direct participation hostility study. Our courts, as I mentioned, have largely accepted this theory. They have disagreed with other aspects, but they agree that we can detain individuals who have been uh, joined with or part of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and associated forces, if it can be demonstrated by indicia of membership. And as I mentioned in the Al-Bahani case, two members of the court said international law did not inform the scope of authority, but this seems to be inconsistent. If international law is the basis of our detention authority, how can it also not limit that authority? So let me review this so you get this clear. Uh, there are six ways in which this administration differs from its predecessors. They may not seem to you earth-shaking, but they are important. With regard to humane treatment, there is an absolute ban on torture, cruel, and human or degrading treatment, and a new commitment, uh, as I've mentioned. With regard to domestic law, we rely on legislative, not inherent authority for detainability. With regard to international law, we read the domestic law consistent with international law rules. In the last administration, it was the executive branch that tried to evade international law and the courts that was urging them not to. And this administration is the executive branch that's seeking to comply and the courts that are urging it not to. We do not use only a law of war paradigm. We combine an approach to uh, the armed conflict issues that includes law enforcement when law enforcement capacities exist. So if a terrorist suspect is in Florence, we would rely on law enforcement methods to secure and capture that person. But that's quite a different situation if they're in an area which is an ungoverned territory. This administration does not use the term global war on terror. You have not heard it. Um, we support only those actions that are authorized by law. 
Uh, we acknowledge that uh, particular issues arise, not just in Afghanistan and Iraq, but in other areas. Uh, and so, for example, the precise geographic scope of the conflict can be debated. And finally, we do not rely on labels like enemy combatant to justify someone's detention. We make a factual case with regard to particular individuals applying law of war analysis about their formal or functional membership in Al-Qaeda and associated organizations. And as a professor, one of the things that has surprised me the most is the extent to which every single person being held, their detention is being justified under a application of a legal theory of detainability to facts that are on the public record and which were developed by detention task force that went to work on January 2009. It is a fact-based specific inquiry, not a label-based inquiry. These are important differences and widely ignored or misunderstood in other parts of the world. Now, some say that our targeting practices uh, have been an exception. And as you may know, My view is that they are not. I have spent a large amount of time examining these targeting practices, being briefed in those practices. Uh, as I say, uh, including uh, operations involving unmanned aerial vehicles. The US remains in an armed conflict with Al Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. Uh, we are exercising both an inherent right of self-defense. And there are five recent failed efforts to attack the United States within the territorial United States in the last year. Congress has authorized the use of force in such cases under the authorization of use of military force resolution. And in this conflict, we have authority, it seems to me, to engage in such activities, including targeting persons who are planning these attacks. Where can this be done? It's obviously a fact-based inquiry, which turns on issues such as sovereignty, uh, willingness and ability of states to suppress, <coughs> and the imminence of the threat. Uh, we take great care to adhere to the laws of war and to apply the principles of distinction and proportionality to make sure that uh, 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 legitimate targets are being singled out and that proportional force is being used. And on this, it seems that there are four basic points. It is not illegal to target a leader of an armed force in an armed conflict. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, uh, there was an effort made uh, and successful to target the Japanese general who had actually planned that attack and was planning the next attack. Uh, that is a permitted activity under the laws of war. It's not illegal to use advanced weapons systems uh, any more than it was illegal to shift from the crossbow to the crossbow from the spear uh, <coughs> or uh, to smart bombs or other weapons which increase the accuracy of targeting and as a result of that, it seems to me, to limit collateral damage. Third, it is not extrajudicial killing to uh, uh, use uh, <coughs> these methods to um, target particular individuals in the course of an armed conflict. No nation state issues its target lists, uh, nor is this a judicial process which is used in the context of warfare. Uh, if this is a legitimate armed conflict, and I firmly believe that it is, uh, we are not applying a judicial paradigm. And finally, uh, it is not assassination. Under our domestic law, the use of lawful weapon systems consistent with the laws of war for precision targeting of specific high-level belligerent leaders acting in self-defense or during an armed conflict is not unlawful and it's not assassination. Now, in sum, uh, with respect to targeting as well as detention, detainability, and treatment, we're committed to assuring that our practices are lawful. Now, in the time remaining, let me uh, mention a number of other areas to suggest that this is only one feature of our approach. Uh, closer engagement with the International Criminal Court, closer engagement with the Human Rights Council, activity on international treaties, uh, and other kinds of commitments to international law, particularly with regard to international legal appointments. Uh, we have had a tangled history with the International Criminal Court. Nobody needs to be reminded of this. The US prosecuted war crimes at Tokyo and Nuremberg, promoted the concept of International Criminal Court in 1995. Bill Clinton favored the concept of an International Criminal Court, but the US did not sign the Rome Treaty in 1998. 
He did sign before the end of his time in office. President Bush famously unsigned that treaty. The court came into force, but by the second Bush term, uh, the United States did not vote against the referral of the Sudan case. By 2008, my predecessor had said, we accept the reality of the court. In 2010, I led the US delegation to the Kampala Review Conference, and two weeks ago, the United States voted for a unanimous uh, referral on Libya to the ICC. So uh, what we have done is shift the default from a policy of hostility to a more productive policy of engagement. Uh, we've ended our hostility toward the court. We meet with members of the uh, Assembly of States parties. Uh, we meet with officials to examine ways we might assist in ongoing cases, Sudan, Congo, uh, uh, Central African Republic, and Kenya. Uh, and we supported the work of the Kampala Review Conference, which is subject to further review of the crime of aggression by 2017. There are still remaining areas of concern. The definition of the crime of aggression the conditions for asserting jurisdiction, the amendment process, but these are all ones in which we are now productively engaged. Uh, the key question right now is, uh, if you have not ratified the new aggression amendments, are you a party or not? The text of the Rome Statute, Article 121.5, says pretty clearly, the court shall not exercise jurisdiction when <coughs> committed uh, regarding a crime covered by the amendment when committed by that state's party or on its territory. And it seems to me this would exclude those who have not ratified. But this is a subject in which the state's parties are having a substantial debate even as we speak. The Human Rights Council, where I'm headed on Friday, is an institution that we rejoined more than a year ago um, to extensive criticism, particularly focused on the Goldstone Report. Uh, while people weren't paying attention, the Human Rights Council has begun to become quite successful. Uh, we're completing our first universal periodic review. Uh, they had a special session where they created a commission of inquiry on Libya. There's a new special rapporteur on freedom of association, a working group on discrimination against women. Uh, mandates have been renewed on Sudan, Haiti, Cambodia, Somalia. Uh, a Cuban initiative to undermine the office of the High Commissioner has been prevented. And the High Commissioner and the Special Rapporteur have been meeting to discuss issues in the Republic of the Congo. Uh, what about treaties? Uh, we're in a very difficult situation in our Senate. The President's party has only 50-some votes and needs 67 uh, to ratify a treaty. Nevertheless, at the end of the last year, uh, we ratified the START Treaty, some tax treaties, defense trade treaties with the UK and Australia child support conventions, we've held hearings on the Women's Rights Convention. We just urged advice and consent to additional protocol two of the Geneva Conventions. And I remain optimistic that the Senate will act favorably on the Law of the Sea Convention, the Disabilities Convention, private and international law treaties, and others. Another area where we have made what I think are very low visibility changes are in our appointments to international bodies. These are individuals who will long outlive this administration. Joan Donahue, my former principal deputy, is now the judge of American nationality on the International Court of Justice. Uh, the brilliant Gerald Newman, US expert on the Human Rights Committee. Jim Brudney is the new expert uh, on the International Legal Organizations uh, Committee of Experts. Sarah Cleveland, who will be arriving shortly, is the US representative on the Venice Commission. Tim Feary, the new chair of the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission. We have announced that we are re uh, engaging on the International Law Convention, uh, Commission nominating Sean Murphy to run. Uh, these are very different figures than served on these bodies in the past. So in sum, I would argue, and I have other areas to mention, in the areas of the laws of war, the areas of official immunity, the Samantar case, <laughs> treaty interpretation, uh, our pending legislation to comply with the uh, International Court of Justice's judgment in Avena, our new attitude toward the International Criminal Court, the Human Rights Council, Kyoto, uh, our uh, appointment of international legal experts. Uh, now, I would just make a simple point. All of this is going on against a background of enormous challenges. Uh, there's a story about two guys from Galway, and one of them says to the other, how do you get to Dublin? And the other says, I, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> Well, if you were uh, in the position of the Obama administration and trying to make these changes with regard to international law, would you start with 
the worst recession since the Depression, armed conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan against Al Qaeda, the worst political environment in history, uh, a crisis in the Middle East that now laps over Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain, Yemen, Libya, Oman, and others, uh, a revival of old challenges like piracy in the Gulf of Aden, diplomatic immunity, and a whole series of new challenges from the 21st century, climate change, shifts in the polar environment, cyber issues with regard to crime, security, aggression, terrorism, food security, food health, and then throw in a 9.0 earthquake in Japan, a 7.8 earthquake in Haiti, one in Chile, a nuclear crisis in Japan, volcanic ash in Iceland, a massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, you just might say, I wouldn't start from here either. But, Uh, having said that, I think I've made the case. We have a coherent and sustainable legal policy approach. It explains our approach in the areas I've described, 9-11, international law, international institutions, treaties, international appointments. I think these are changes and changes we can believe in. And I will say this, this has not been easy, but I do not believe these are small accomplishments. Now, <clears throat> Uh, this, I think, is an international law that reflects American distinctiveness, falls within the margin of appreciation, is consistent with emerging global understandings, and is consistent with American values. And let me close with this story. Um, before I became a, a law student, or pre-law student, I was a physics student. And um, uh, we had an experiment, in fact, to shout by this um, glass of water, this vial of water, uh, in which uh, my professor uh, showed that the water had been ionized, and he put a series of uh, uh, steel needles on the water, and they were pointing in a whole bunch of different directions. And then he took uh, a machine and he waved it over the machine. And everyone said, there's no change, there's no change. And then he dropped the needles in again, and they were all aligned. And he said to us, this is a water vortex magnetizer. It treats water magnetically. Uh, it uh, transfers a natural vibrational imprint onto the water through what he calls vortex ion exchange. And then he said the most important thing, you can't see it, but this is change. And it's necessary change. Uh, we have reversed the polarity of the ions at the molecular level. We have reduced surface tension. We've inhibited the growth of bacteria. And this is the necessary step to everything we want to do ahead. So to promote change, it seems to me we need to do the same, to patiently reduce polarity uh, and to continue on the efforts uh, begun and on which I work every day. Thank you. So, questions? Kim. Uh, thank you for a really um, comprehensive talk. And I'm interested in how a couple of the pieces of the talk uh, fit together, particularly, as you can imagine, with respect to the detention operations um, and targeting operations that the U.S. is engaged in. Um, it's, of course, terrific news that the U.S. is no longer engaged in torture, and that was an executive order we all applauded on day one of the Obama administration. And it's also quite um, evident, I think, that the U.S. is now engaged in what you call fact-based determinations of both detention and targeting operations. Um, I'm wondering how these two policies fit together, though. Uh, and the question has to do with where the facts come from through which detention and targeting operations are carried out. Well, that's pretty simple. Evidence obtained by torture is excluded from the analysis. Uh, by a, just the U.S. or by other parties as well? Uh, by the U.S. Um, th this is a basic tenet of the, uh, of the methods by which this is done. Okay. Uh, this, this, uh, the, the people who are being held, um, there's been a massive file review one thing that was quite shocking, or I may I use the word surprising, is that large numbers of individuals were being held on Guantanamo at the end of the last administration, 
and they didn't know very much about them. Uh, they had been picked up in various operations that were essentially sweeps. Uh, individualized cases were not made against them. The evidence uh, gathered was not assembled in a single file. On January 22, 2009, President Obama required the creation of an interagency working group on uh, detentions. Uh, it involved six government agencies. Uh, those government agencies assembled the files. Uh, people from my office attend. They've gone through every single file. Every file was scored and rated. Uh, evidence based on mistreatment was removed from the analysis uh, or considered unreliable and assessments were made on the other factors. Now, about that time, habeas litigation began, and those cases were litigated. And they've basically been litigated on clean facts. Now, in certain circumstances, there have been so-called clean teams, which come in and reassess uh, based on, uh, you know, situation now, long after mistreatment has occurred. Sometimes the same basic story remains on that analysis, and so that has been asserted as the rationale or the current understanding. Uh, but I can't tell you how many hours have gone into this, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. So when I say that uh, we're doing this based not on labels, um, there are many things in my life I would prefer not to know. Uh, I now have studied organizational charts of the major terrorist organizations. I know the individuals by name. Uh, I uh, understand with regard to hundreds of them uh, exactly what they did, exactly what the evidence is, exactly what the options might be. Um, and um, you know, when you do that, you conclude that there are a significant number of people out there who are dedicating their lives to terrorist activities as part of a transnational network. There's no other conclusion. And those numbers are not declining. Uh, in the last six months, we had the underwear bomber in Detroit. We had the Times Square bomber in New York. Uh, these are, uh, fortunately, attacks that did not succeed. But they're not ending. So uh, this is now a feature of the landscape in which we operate. As a government official, one of my jobs is to make sure that uh, the rule of law is respected, but also that our security is protected. Security consistent with our values. That's the Obama administration approach. More questions? Uli. My question doesn't relate to human rights and humanitarian law, but a broader question. Uh, after the Second World War, the United States was a unique leader in international institution building. All the major agreements were proposed by the United States, UN Charter, Bretton Woods Agreements, GATT, IDO Charter. If we look today at international trade regulation, financial regulation, environmental regulation, human rights, criminal court, there is hardly any a U.S. leadership for the building of multilateral institutions, for multilateral rule of law, for compulsory jurisdiction in order to protect multilateral rule of law. And my, rec my question is, how do you see the uh, domestic political problems which prevent uh, this kind of leadership, uh, which the world needs, because we are facing a unique financial crisis, we are facing a unique environmental crisis, the world trading system uh, risks to uh, break down. So uh, going back to the US history, after the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act in 1930, which is widely believed to be a major cause of the worldwide economic and political crisis in the 1930s, the United States adopted the uh, 1932 Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act. And the uh, philosophy behind it was we have to delegate powers to the U.S. executive to negotiate international treaties in order to contain uh, interest group politics in the U.S. Congress. Uh, but we know now we, the U.S. president doesn't have tra a trade mandate, doesn't have a mandate to conclude the key, the, the Kyoto Protocol negotiations and so far. So are we not today a little bit in the situation which was uh, characterized by U.S. President Hayes in 1874 when U.S. President Hayes said 
This is a government of the people, by the people, for the people no longer. It is a government of corporations, by corporations and for corporations, which prevents US leadership for multilateral institution building. Well, the last statement strikes me as a uh, quite striking non sequitur from what you said before. Let me just ask this question. What's the most important number in American international agreements? What's the most important number? And if you can't answer this question, this is the most basic fact of American foreign policy. 67. Why 67? If you don't know, what do you need? 67 is necessary to do what? To ratify a treaty. It is almost impossible to get 67. This is not a political problem, it's a legal aspect of our Constitution. 34 senators can block a treaty. 30, it's a supermajority rule. Uh, so that's the simple answer to your question. Barack Obama struggled for months to get 60 votes for health care. Months, eight months. If he has to struggle to get 60 votes for health care, he doesn't have 67 votes. Now, that's not helped by the fact of politics that the Republicans have politicized issues that were previously non political. The START Treaty previously was unanimous. It took over a year to get a new START Treaty by a vote of 71, when previously it had gone through by 92. You mentioned the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act. That shows the one major exception in the area of trade because the House uh, has the constitutional authority for originating uh, imports and excises. Uh, since 1934, after the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, we have shifted to a regime of what you call prior fast-track legislative approval in which you can get approval by a majority of both houses, which is how the United States entered the NAFTA, which is how the United States entered the WTO. On neither case, WTO or NAFTA, was the executive branch even close to 67. It was not even close to 67. But Congress can withhold this authority and has chosen to do so. So we have a struggle between the executive branch and the legislative branch in the trade area over trade reduction. As I speak, we're discussing issues, about three um, issues. Uh, the uh, Korea Free Trade Agreement, the Colombia Free Trade Agreement, and the Panama Free Trade Agreement. A number of areas have traditionally been done by treaty. Human rights has been done by treaty. Uh, accession to international organizations has been done by treaty. Uh, nuclear agreements have been done by treaty. They require 67. Uh, in this political environment, it is very, 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 very difficult to get 67. When I, when I clerk for the Supreme Court, there are many, many debates among the law clerks about jurisprudential theories. Justice Brennan said, boys, <laughs> he called everyone boys, even though there are girls in the room too. He said, in this court, there's only one rule that matters. And you go like this. You say, what's that, my hand? Five. <laughs> if you don't have five, you don't have the court. If you don't have 67, you don't have a treaty. That's our structure. Now, you could well argue that this is uh, an impediment to US leadership, it makes it difficult. Well, let me give you another example. This is not the only impediment. Uh, a treaty needs to come out of the Foreign Relations Committee. The Foreign Relations Committee has both Democratic and Republican senators. Only one senator on the Republican side has been regularly internationalist, that's Richard Lugar. Uh, to get a vote to the floor in which you get even close to 67, you need three Republican senators, and you rarely have three Republican senators. Or consider this, to get time on the floor for a treaty to go through requires approval of the majority leader of the Senate. The majority leader of the Senate is from Nevada. Nevada is a landlocked state. So uh, you have to explain to the Senate majority leader why he should devote time to the law of the sea treaty when he's running for re-election in a constituency in which they don't care about the law of the sea treaty as an issue that's gonna bring jobs to their constituency. So it's true there's American politics connected to it, but it all revolves around this single number. 
But whenever I come over here and I'm assailed about American politics, and then I ask, what is the re most relevant number? People don't know. So the students here are just emblazoned this on your forehead, 67. If you can't get 67, you need to figure out another way. So uh, if you look at the additional protocol one, article 75, you know, the chance of getting 67 for our additional protocol one of the Geneva Conventions is zero. Uh, to follow it, the humane treatment provisions out of a sense of legal obligation requires executive branch action. That's essentially why the US government has done that. But uh, the notion that somehow this is an example of a lack of commitment on the part of the US government, as opposed to a feature of our constitutional structure that we can't change without a constitutional amendment, uh, again, um, it, it requires a deeper uh, understanding and analysis. It's just a basic feature. Uh, we, we don't live in a parliamentary system. You can have a president who has lost support from a large number of people who continues to be president for four years. You know, we've had presidents who have 20% popularity rating one year into their second term, and they still have three years left. There is no change. So these are just important political facts about the American constitutional system, which helps to explain why the Americans tend to have a different approach, not radically different, but with very significant differences of nuance. Thank you. Emilia. In fact, to change from uh, the polarity from uh, unilateralism to multilateralism, it should be a very difficult move. And 67 is the, the real figure. But the United States and the European Union reached the, the 67 uh, members in the Senate to ratify the Mutual Legal Assistance Agreement and the Extradition Agreement, which is a very, very powerful and useful legal framework that can be developed. And is, it has just started to do it. But uh, the U.S. administration has also negotiation, negotiated a, a lot of executive agreement, like the passenger name record agreement, twice, in 2004 and 2007. And the second version was much uh, uh, tougher than the first one. And we are trying, as on the European Parliament, to make it less, less strict. And now there is a draft mandate for a framework agreement on data protection when security is at stake. And this could be a fantastic occasion, I don't know if with the Senate or with the administration, to uh, make some uh, coherence in the different policy in the European Union and the United States. You have the same feeling. Well, I think you raised uh, three different issues. One is, uh, one way to address this treaty issue of 67 is to pursue alternative agreement arrangements, which require less approval. Nevertheless, they still require consultation, which goes to the second point. The reason that Vice President Lambrinidis and your Libe committee came to Washington, I think, was not just to meet with the executive branch, but was to meet with members of Congress as well. And I'm sure that uh, you know, many of the members of the U.S. Congress uh, are only dimly aware of the changes of the Lisbon Treaty and uh, the new role of the European Parliament. And I think the um, SWIFT agreement and the passenger name recognition, pa passenger name agreement were two different uh, wake-up calls about exactly how this would, the political dynamic would be changed. So I think that that was very useful uh, in terms of a kind of engagement on this question. Uh, going forward, uh, I think now that we're, uh, this initial period has passed, the question is how to develop these kinds of ongoing uh, relationships. And you know, obviously there are questions of uh, the democratic deficit and accountability within the European system. Uh, the US Congress, there is no doubt that members of the Congress are very sensitive to the concerns of their constituency, and that in, in on any, any single issue, they have one mood and go home for recess and then come back you know, aware of what people on the street are saying. 
in our House of Representatives, people are elected every two years. They're in the middle of a continual campaign. At least on the Senate side, they only have to be reelected every six years. So they have a little bit of breathing room. Uh, and finally, um, when I go back to Washington, none of the issues I've discussed are on the front burner. None of them. None of them. <laughs> what are they talking about? Uh, they're talking about jobs. They're talking about the deficit. And they're talking about whether the government should shut down. Um, if there's no new legislation adopted be between now and Saturday, the government will shut down. Two weeks ago, we went through this, and laws were passed, and the government was kept going. I, I, as general counsel of the State Department, many of my emails go to the question, what if there's, you know, in fact, you know, important question. If I am here in Europe and the government shuts down, <laughs> What am I supposed to do? I mean, can I use my BlackBerry? Right. <laughs> no, you cannot accept gifts. These are, there are all kinds of ethical rules. What you're supposed to do, complete your business, head to the airport, and go home as quickly as possible. Um, and the last time this happened was in 1995. When this is the mood, it's very difficult to focus on the questions we're discussing. Um, not to mention the fact that uh, uh, you know, the, the spending for foreign policy is dramatically uh, under, under uh, scrutiny or review. When, when I was dean of Yale Law School, um, you know, my discretionary budget based on private money that I raised would allow us to hold a seminar like this, uh, you know, very simply. Uh, at the State Department, if the Libe Committee comes, uh, I pay for their coffee from my own pocket. That's, that's essentially how this uh, works. It's, it's a shocking situation, really a shocking situation. So um, what I think many people uh, are surprised to learn is how much these financial realities interfere uh, in the day-to-day -day operation. You know, the, the assumption is money will be available. You know, so for example, you know, Japan is facing a nuclear crisis at the moment. Two weeks ago, nobody thought this was going to happen. Somewhere the money to address this issue has to come from somewhere. And as you know, many members of our Congress think that the budget should be cut. The, the price for even extending the government for another two weeks will be to cut billions more. So this is a, a, an amazingly difficult environment to operate. Now, when I was an academic, Academics say, oh, assume we can solve these problems. <laughs> what is the right thing to do? Now, it's obviously great to have that perspective, but you can't simply assume you're going to solve the problems since those problems are a prerequisite. Solving those problems are a prerequisite to even being able to address the issues you're concerned about. More questions? Yes, uh, I will have a, a question concerning the cooperation with the ICC, even though maybe you can give me again the, the answer about the 67 number, magic number, but uh, I have the impression that, uh, and this question may color a little bit many other fields, is that uh, uh, cooperation with the ICC in the way it's done now, as long as the United States does not become a a full member does not ratify the, the treaty, is more of a cooperation that serves political and strategic uh, objectives of the United States, as long as you can cooperate with, uh, with the cases that are ongoing, indicate or influence the cases that the court will take, but never becoming yourself uh, uh, open to possible cases in the future by the ICC. So uh, I don't know if this, uh, is there a, a decision by the Obama administration to become a part of the ICC, which is blocked by the 67 number, or there is no such decision? Well, I, first of all, um, you know, we have changed the policy from one of hostility to engagement in two years. That's not nothing. So now you're saying, where's the 67? Good question. Uh, if we took a vote now, 
you would not get 50. Uh, on the other hand, there are things we can do within the scope of the current relationship that we are doing. Uh, there is no ongoing case that the United States is not supporting. And uh, I think here's the most important thing. The United States gave full cooperation to every ad hoc tribunal. Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Lebanon, Cambodia. So it doesn't make sense uh, to have a policy of support for ad hoc tribunals, uh, but a, a policy of hostility for the standing tribunal. Now, I think in 1998, there was a reasonable question, will this court become operational, and if so, how quickly? So that, I think, has been answered. But let's be honest, the court has no convictions. The court has no final judgments. After 10 years, it's still in its early stages, and it has just taken on a new referral in Libya, which may be its most challenging case yet. In that circumstance, would you rather have the U.S. supporting or outside and hostile? You, you can tell me. Uh, my view is this is an accomplishment. Uh, is it as fast as you might like? Probably not. Would you rather be here than where the Bush administration was in 2003? I think you'd rather be here. If, if you w would prefer the other way, just let me know. <laughs> Following on from that, um, I think you'd agree that the mood in Washington today is very different from how it was when President Obama was, was elected. And um, I guess my question is, given the um, sort of continuing criticism of issues surrounding the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the war against al-Qaeda, um, will that tend to actually limit the possibilities for this administration to move further forward on the issues that you've described uh, this morning? Um, will it, in fact, push America back towards isolationism and telling the rest of the world, well, you know, we'll do it our way, and, and that's that? I, I think there's no ri risk of American isolationism. There's a risk of American overstretch. That's the risk. Uh, you know, I served in the Clinton administration second half, in which, uh, among many other things, the president was being impeached and, and other things. On the other hand, it was a time of peace and prosperity. And peace and prosperity solves almost every problem in politics. Now we're in a time that's not peace or prosperity. So it's a much more complicated situation for a new president, and he's working hard. Um, I think the administration is working hard. There's no other way to describe it. Uh, the fact that the political environment is so fractured has made it even worse. You know, to, to, uh, to get uh, appointments confirmed normally takes no time at all. Uh, there was some kind of uh, gentle person's agreement that this would be done routinely. Now every single appointment is contested, uh, which I think makes the environment extremely difficult. Uh, nevertheless, um, two years in, two and a half years in, two and a third years in, the, <laughs> um, you're seeing this progress happening. Uh, and the real question is, will it continue or will they change course again? My own hope is that it will continue because I don't think anybody liked the old course. I don't think anyone here liked it. I think many in Washington didn't like it. I think deep in everyone's memory uh, is the notion that this will not get better if we return to the old ways. Um, a lot of activity was spent unproductively. And so I think it's um, uh, an important effort to keep going. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it would be great. Uh, if uh, after eight years or 10 years now of, since 9-11, you could come in and in one year through the magic wand, change everything to the opposite. Uh, important mistakes were made very early on. Uh, I've been to Afghanistan. Uh, it's a very complicated situation there. As you know, Richard, you know, uh, there are many people operating there who are using it as a base 
and and a concern would be to simply abandon that field simply opens the door for it to become another center of activity um, that's not a attractive prospect either on the other hand an open-ended commitment is also uh, not something that enjoys broad u.s support so the administration has reached a position on that which it's trying to enforce so <coughs> Um, and meanwhile, hoping that the prosperity returns. Uh, and that is indeed uh, a central focus. Um, my guess will be that the future of this administration will turn not on these issues, but on uh, employment numbers. Uh, and uh, uh, another will go to the relationship between the executive branch and the new Congress, which I think came in with a set of political commitments made in the November elections uh, that are already being re-examined in light of reality. So there's a, a process of education going on on both sides. And then looming in the background, of course, the, um, uh, the presidential election of 2012. Uh, I was very struck. I read the book by George H.W. Bush and Brent Scowcroft where they described that in 1989, between Tiananmen Square, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were just in a state of overstretch. And some of the things that they did not focus on were the Balkans. It's hard for me to say that, you know, that I'm sure they were working like crazy. But the last few weeks, it's, it's astonishing. I, I've never seen anything like it. We're, in the Middle East, we're watching an ice flow break up. I mean, every day we, we have at the State Department a uh, situation report. Every day I wake up, here's what happened last night in Oman, Yemen, uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, you know, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria. I, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, then Suddenly, you know, you read after a couple of days of this, earthquake, biggest earthquake in the history of Japan, then tsunami, then nuclear crisis. Uh, and meanwhile, on the other thing is, debate continues as to whether to shut down the US government. <laughs> so there's a kind of disconnect uh, here. Uh, but, you know, it's, um, I can't say it's not interesting. <laughs> Um, if the U.S. is in a, an armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, that doesn't mean that actually the U.S. will be in a global war in terror in the sense because Al-Qaeda has is no state, has no territory, is decentralized, which means that potentially and theoretically the, the war against or the armed conflict against Al-Qaeda could extend instead to, hold the, to the whole world, which means that even though you don't say anymore that you are in a uh, global war on terror, you are conceptually or essentially in a global war on terror. Um, my second point related to that, because I know there are these problems within the U.S. administration in the sense how problematic it would be having this uh, theoretically global war on terror because you're in a, in a conflict with a terrorist group. How would you, um, I would like to know what's the concept of self-defense that you had in mind when you talk about it, that the U.S. has the right of self-defense. Because we know the concept of the Article 51, uh, especially in media scene, and the way I understood you, you could use it, you are simply rendering the concept meaningless, or you could stretch the idea of media scene in the sense because there's some Al Qaeda leader in X place, and he's a danger, we should kill him, even though there is no, there will be no proper self defense as, I, as, I, as it has been traditionally understood. Thank you. Well, those are both good questions. On the first, um uh, there's a difference between uh, armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, which is a particular transnational network uh, that has a leader, it has a leadership structure, uh, it has certain associated forces, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, etc. Uh, it operates in a number of countries, but it doesn't operate everywhere. So um, there are many terrorist groups or groups that use instruments of terror, who I'm sure hate the United States, hate the EU, uh, but have largely local objectives. Uh, the US has no 
legal authority under domestic law. Uh, the authorization of use of military force runs against Al Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. It doesn't run against uh, a terrorist group that could arise tomorrow with local objectives. Uh, on the second point, you say that the self defense argument renders meaningless. Uh, I disagree. The, um, uh, there's a difference between a preemptive self defense argument and the notion that you don't have to wait for the next attack to happen to assume that the person who has done attacks in the past is planning another attack. You know, Osama bin Laden, over the course of the last 20 years, has launched dozens of attacks on the United States. What is he is doing today, I don't know. But does that mean that we have to wait until uh, the suicide bombers on the plane to <laughs> respond as a matter of self-defense? Uh, in criminal law, as you know from your criminal law uh, work, uh, if someone's living in their home and their partner is beating them every day, if that partner is approaching them, they don't have to be beating them for the person to respond in self-defense. So uh, you say it renders meaningless, I disagree. It requires elaboration of the standard of self-defense in those circumstances. Uh, it requires caution to make sure we're not applying a theory of preemptive self-defense. But self-defense seems to me an available and appropriate legal rationale. Next question. Thank you. Let me come back to the, 20, to the 67 uh, number. Uh, you're, of course, absolutely right. That's our feeling also in Europe, that uh, the cleavage between the Republicans and Democrats has never been so acute. Uh, we know that it's very difficult to have the states moving on the so-called mega issues like uh, climate change or Doha without uh, uh, cross-partisan uh, uh, support. But isn't this part of the problem? I mean, uh, when you say, when you answer that the 67 is what's wrong with us, I see this as an instrumental uh, reply. Uh, I would be more interested to see the politics of the reply. I mean, isn't there uh, uh, a responsibility for the political leadership in the U.S. to uh, try to foster cross-party support? Isn't, are there means, tools, instruments that uh, can bridge uh, differences, can have the system move uh, on these mega issues? Uh, because with all due respect, saying 67 is an issue, we can do much. Uh, we could have said the same thing uh, in Europe, saying... It's uh, a larger number than 67. Yeah, but Parliament voted down the SWIFT uh, treaty, so it's, it's lost. Uh, don't bother. It's lost forever. No, political leaders in Europe uh, negotiated again, uh, established new links, uh, revisited the issue, fostered alliances, the political families came closer together, and at the end, we managed to come out with something meaningful. So, uh, to cut the long story short, is there a way to go beyond the uh, 67 uh, stumbling block and uh, look what's next? I don't think you can watch Obama since 2004 and not think that his goal is to try to build some sort of uh, bipartisan coalition that allows him to accomplish things that require supermajority. That's what he does almost every single day. Uh, how willing uh, the political forces are to co cooperate in that activity is another story. And, um, you know, healthcare was a good example where he was looking for some consensus that would allow him to achieve this healthcare quickly. You know, he looked to Massachusetts where Republican Governor Mitt Romney had a similar bill to the one that was adopted. You would have thought. This is a potential basis for some kind of bipartisan outcome. It turned out not to be. So, uh, and I give the president credit. He's still trying to do this. Um, I think he's genuinely committed to it. Uh, he keeps calling the groups together and uh, seeking some kind of uh, set of issues on which there can be agreement. But at the end of the day, uh, they end up doing 
many of these things through contested votes. Uh, the, the START Treaty was a good example. Um, I think it's fair to say that most of the people in the State Department were genuinely surprised that this became a partisan issue. You know, the last couple of START treaties went through with almost no conversation. It was a pure issue of national security. It seemed uncontroversial. Suddenly, by the end of the first year of the uh, President's administration, or second year, they were fighting for every single vote on the START treaty. And it was because a group of uh, opponents had said they didn't want to give Obama a political victory. You know, this is a treaty that Reagan had gotten uh, approved. So, uh, you know, there's no way to, it seems to me, there's no way to control for what people choose to politicize. And I think uh, the president has made a good faith effort. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, a number of these issues turn on three, three things. One is operating within the zone of discretion that we have. Um, you know, you, you might want us to ratify the International Criminal Court Treaty. That's unlikely very time soon. So the U.S. executive branch is operating within the zone of discretion that we have. Uh, a second is continuing to try to achieve bipartisan agreements, uh, and that effort is ongoing. And then the third is legislative tactics to get particular issues done. And that has consumed more energy than I think people would have liked. It would be much better to have a strategic vision than to rely on these tactics. But if a strategic vision is made impossible, by the political imperatives of the moment, better to do something than nothing. Thank you very much, Harold. Thank you very much indeed.